today as they feasted on Jesus' compassion. All my Christian life, I have read this passage in Matthew 15. But I have never ever realized that the real feast that took place in the feeding of the 5,000 was not the fish and the bread. It was not the wonderful healings. It was Jesus' compassion and his love for people. So with that in mind, I'll read aloud this passage in Matthew 15, 29 to 32. And I'd encourage you this whole worship time, this message, the hymns of praise, communion, center your thinking on Jesus' compassion for you. He knows everything about you and me, and he has tremendous compassion for us. After Jesus returned, he walked along Lake Galilee and then climbed a mountain and took his place, ready to receive visitors. They came, this is obviously modern English, they came, tons of them, bringing along the paraplegic, the blind, the maimed, the mute, all sorts of people in need, and more or less threw them down at Jesus' feet to see what he would do with them. He healed them. When the people saw the mutes speaking, the maimed healthy, the paraplegics walking around, the blind looking around, they were astonished and let everyone know that God was blazingly alive among them. But Jesus wasn't finished with them. He called his disciples and said, I hurt for these people. For three days now they've been with me, and now they have nothing to eat. I can't send them out away without a meal. They'd probably collapse on the road. And then most of the time we read the rest of that scripture, don't we? But I want to stop here and focus on Jesus' compassion. There's some really high mountains around the Sea of Galilee. I was surprised when we were there four or five years ago how high they were. So when it says he climbed a mountain, uh, especially by Kansas standards, they're high. Of course, they're not the the Alps and it's not the uh, Sierra Nevada or the Rocky Mountains, but they're high mountains. And... uh, he came, went to the top of a mountain and sat down. And uh, there were many, many people following him. Now, Kathleen and I uh, were amazed at how beautiful the, the place is where Jesus fed the 5,000. And... Uh, The Jewish people being very, very uh, agriculturally oriented, they're self-sufficient in their own food and they export food, this little tiny nation. All the hills around the Sea of Galilee, with a few exceptions, have drip irrigation where they really conserve water. There are fruit trees now all around in the mountains of the Sea of Galilee. It just absolutely surprised me to death. Uh, semi-tropical fruit tr- trees, because it rarely freezes there uh, very deeply. And the first people they brought, Matthew says, were paraplegics. I grew up with a paraplegic. Pat Patterson was shot during World War II, and it, he was paralyzed from the waist down, and he went to college with my dad, and... My folks didn't have much money, and so both of them had to work to put my dad through college. And a lot of times, 
Pat Patterson and his wife Marion would watch over me when I was like eight, nine, or ten years old. And uh, Pat's upper body was absolutely solid muscle he, he, because that's the only muscles he had. And I always wanted to have muscles like Pat Patterson, but I saw all his struggles of not being able to walk and use his legs. And Jesus healed paraplegics. If you've ever seen a person that's blind, when Jesus prayed for them, they could see. Maimed people that had been injured were healed. People that couldn't speak began to speak. And it was more than just the physical healings that these people were experiencing. They saw the love of God in Jesus' eyes and in his words. They saw his compassion. Surgeons, doctors who are surgeons, are some of the hardest people to work with. I think they're all autistic, <laughs> and they're really good in surgery, but their people skills many times are really poor. And I experienced that over and over again with surgeons. There's some exceptions to that. So if you're a surgeon, you're listening to me today, maybe you're the exception. I hope you are. And then I discovered something else. Fighter pilots were really, really hard to work with. You know, you have to have a tremendous ego to be a surgeon and a fighter pilot, and you have to be really good with physical things. And fighter pilots have to have incredible three-dimensional reflexes and skills. And then one time I got a patient that had been a surgeon and a fighter pilot. And I thought, I've had it. I've totally had it. He turned out to be the nicest person I've ever worked with in my life <laughs> as, a, as a therapist. But uh, as a general rule, uh, uh, many of us have trouble expressing compassion. To a certain degree, we're all a little like a surgeon and uh, like a fighter pilot. Uh, and some people we just interface with better than other people. But Jesus was interfacing his compassion on everybody. And uh, they were astonished. They'd never seen God's love like this before. They'd never experienced the power of God's compassion like this before. And I love how this translation, it says, they began to realize that God was blazingly alive among them. Blazingly alive. Not just a little alive, like brighter than you could possibly imagine, alive with love and compassion. Don't you love nurses and, and doctors that have compassion? And most of them have a great deal of compassion, although in certain situations they're not able to fully express it. I know this doctor... He tried to save this little boy from cancer, and he couldn't do it. He was an oncologist. And uh, when he told the family of the little boy that he wasn't able to save them and save their son, he rushed out of the room. And his nurses found him at his desk sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. Because he had done everything he could to save this little boy from cancer. And it was humanly impossible to do it with modern medicine. And then multiply the compassion that that doctor had for that little boy. And we have Jesus of Nazareth healing people. And the compassion was tangible. It was physical. It was real. 
And I want to want to tell you, you know, so many people were looking for this perfect person to be with, or these perfect friends, or perfect children. That's not going to happen. I encourage you to make the real love of your life not a human being, but this Jesus of Nazareth and this incredible compassion. And his compassion just didn't go for their physical healing. It says, but Jesus wasn't finished with them. Isn't that a great sentence? And it means Jesus wasn't finished with them from a compassion standpoint. He called his disciples. And he said, I'm, I'm hurting for these people. They have not eaten for three days. Now, in America, we have such an abundance of food. But if any of you have never eaten for three days or more, you begin to realize how weak you get. You get physically weak. And he says, I'm, I'm worried that these people are going to collapse on the road. And then he said to his disciples, you give them something to eat. <laughs> and they, the disciples basically had nothing, but a little boy fortunately did. But if you've not eaten for three days, I'll tell you what happens. I, I've had this happen. I couldn't eat for three days. On the third day, actually after three days, your desire for food gradually goes away. But the first three days, you are really, really hungry. And then after that, your stomach starts to shrink a little bit. But by the time I reached three days and was not able to eat, I started dreaming about food. <laughs> and uh, I mean, there were vivid dreams. Uh, and I never thought in the world that would ever happen. But these people were so short of food. I'm sure some of them, that second night, they, they were with Jesus, and they slept, and they were sleeping out in the open. They were dreaming about food, too, like I was. And I'm sure they were weak. And Jesus was concerned about everything, about the healing their bodies, about their spiritual food, and he was sharing that spiritual food, and about their physical food. Jesus is concerned about every single thing about your life. Everything, your finances, your physical health, your spiritual health, your psychological health, your emotional health, everything. Jesus has incredible compassion. Incredible compassion. I'm thinking of missionaries to China you know, when the communists took over China, most people don't understand Chinese history. And I didn't until just a few years ago. There were hundreds of individual kingdoms in China that were constantly fighting each other. And then during World War II, the Japanese came in, and of course they just knock off one kingdom after another kingdom after another kingdom. And they conquered a lot of China. And they had a much smaller nation than China, but they had a real organized military, a real disciplined military. And they just knocked kingdom after kingdom after kingdom. Well, in the process of driving back the Japanese, China got unified. And that's when the communists took over China. That's, um, that's real simplistic Chinese history, and it's not tit for tat, totally accurate, but that's just a general sweep of Chinese history. So China is now one nation because it used to be hundreds of little divided kingdoms. And uh, God is in the process of unifying the entire human race with his compassion. You know, Christians and Jews and most people that are Christians don't realize this. They just sat in the major cities of Rome. They didn't go out into the rural areas as much as they should have. And so when Islam took over, 
For the first time, many people in the world heard about Jesus. They didn't really hear the Christian message about Jesus. But it was a beginning message about Jesus, you know. And believe it or not, the Quran has a lot of stories about Jesus. But their mistake, of course, is they don't believe he rose from the dead. But they were part of spreading the message of Jesus. And there's, folks, there are millions of secret believers in Islamic countries today, followers of Jesus. You never hear that on the news. And they were introduced to it by Islam. And then missionaries and other people have been able to get in. They've been able to find out who Jesus really was. There's millions of Christians. Just in China alone, there's like 100 million Christians in an atheistic, communist country. And there's probably more than 100 million, but that's about all we know about. But Jesus, you know, I don't, there's no, no other religious leader in the history of the world that had the compassion of Jesus. And I've taught world religions for years, you know, in colleges. Nobody had the compassion of Jesus. They were feasting on Jesus' compassion. You know, if you know somebody really, really loves you, just sitting at a table with them, isn't that, isn't that wonderful? Just sitting at a table with them, you feel full of love. You may not have a lot of food sometimes, but you feel full of love. And really, compassion is what everything is all about. That's why I so enjoyed this last series that Dan Mulby taught us by Max Lucado because Max is all about Jesus' compassion and Jesus' love. Jesus didn't come to bring us a whole bunch of rules and regulations. He came to bring us love. Now we need rules and regulations and Paul developed some of those. But Jesus came to give us compassion. Uh, one of the things, a sort of a side note to this message, but I want to encourage you to think about it. When you really, really want something from God, or when you really, really want to hear God's word to you, or when you really, really want to be used by God, think seriously about not eating food for one day or two days or three days. Think seriously about fasting. Jesus' disciples were greatly criticized, and, and people came to Jesus and said, Hey, how come you don't fast like um, our Jewish laws require? And Jesus looked at him and he smiled and he said, When the bride and bridegroom are here, you don't, you don't fast. You rejoice and you eat together. But when the bridegroom is gone, then you will fast. In other words, Jesus said, you and I, from time to time, seeking God's will, should fast. And boy, that's not real popular uh, in most of the world. Even the, the, even the parts of the world that have a lot of food, you're never going to hear very many messages on fasting but it's right there in the New Testament and so uh, I'd encourage you to think seriously about fasting I don't know about you but I I'd sort of like to have more compassion for people and what happens is a wonderful psychological thing that happens is when you and I have more compassion and love for people surprise surprise we get compassion and love for ourselves. Almost everyone is, hears my voice this morning, you really don't love yourself as much as God loves you. You're harder on yourself than God would ever think about being on you. Much harder. Think seriously about the, the poor people with Jesus, they sort of had an involuntary fast, you know. <laughs> They're in the middle of nowhere and they couldn't get to grocery stores, which they didn't have in those days. They couldn't get to the the markets 
And so they were automatically forced to fast. Now, uh, one of the great things about fasting is, too, they hadn't eaten for three days. When Jesus did the miracle and the loaves and the fish, that was the best tasting bread <laughs> and best tasting fish they had eaten in a long time because they were very hungry. Do you remember how hungry you used to get when you were a little kid before mealtimes? You're just starving to death. Mom was the best cook ever, even if she was sort of a mediocre cook. <laughs> Kids that are really hungry can really, really love their mom's food. And, uh, you know, uh, when we're really, really hungry for God and God speaks to us and blesses our lives, that's the best food of all. So, so fasting uh, is, a, is a part of this, sort of a sub-part. I want to close this, this message uh, by telling a wonderful story. Uh, this hospice nurse tells a story. They were getting new patients in the hospice, and those of you that aren't too familiar with what hospice is, hospice is a wonderful thing that our, our nation supports to help people and their families who are dying and help them uh, have love, help them have freedom from pain, and help them uh, in the last few days and weeks of their lives. And this hospice nurse tells this story of there was a man that came in to the hospice and he said uh, this man was a businessman he'd been traveling all over the world he was really well known but he was at the very least an agnostic and probably an atheist and his his request his last request before they selected the staff members that was supposed to help him in hospice was, I don't want any Christians. <laughs> I know a few people like that. I don't want any Christians to be my hospice care. So, one of the ladies who was a nurse who wrote this story was a dedicated Christian. And she said, uh, I'll volunteer to be his <laughs> hospice nurse. And she was. And for the next few weeks, she cared for him with compassion and love and developed a relationship with him. And he began to think of her as part of his family. And indeed she was. She spent a lot of time with this patient you know, the, the most wonderful thing you can do for many people that are sick is just to listen to them and interact with them and to listen with them and interact with them. And then she got a call that he was clearly didn't have long to live and he was still conscious. And very gently and with great compassion, she told him about Jesus' love. All his defenses were down. All his famous trips, his famous books, his famous possessions, all that was gone and he was dying. And he had no more. And all his intellectual arguments were gone. And before he died, he accepted Jesus as his personal savior. And she said, God had the timing just right so that I was available to be with him in his last few breaths. She didn't say a thing about Jesus that whole time until she felt the Holy Spirit and he were ready. And you're going to see that gentleman in the life to come because of a dedicated Christian hospice nurse with the exact same compassion as Jesus led him to a faith in Jesus Christ. And there's a, another sequel to that story is she was Jesus. The nurse was Jesus to him. 
Because anywhere there's compassion and love, there's Jesus. But she was willingly transformed into Jesus for that man. Isn't that a glorious story? I don't know about you, but I want to hang around with Christians like that. I want to hang out with Christians like that. And I know you do too. Would you bow with me in prayer? How can we ever thank you for the compassion of Jesus, God? You know how weak we all are. But we pray, Lord, as we have studied this wonderful story together, you will make us more full of compassion. Because we know the foundation of Jesus' miracles was his love and compassion. Lord, I pray that anyone who has been resisting the Holy Spirit, who has heard these words today, may become humble like this man and accept Jesus as their personal Savior. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.